this a while back ago. I don't know if anybody remembers. Beryllium versus lead. Anybody remember beryllium versus lead? Yeah, right. Uh, lead is lead has a lot of electrons. Lead is an excellent absorber of X-rays, and it's cheap. Therefore, lead shields are very common. But you don't want to be drinking lead cocktails, right? Um, barium, barium sulfate, is it very soluble? No, so it's a stable solid, and so it's not really going to get metabolized and cause you much damage. And it's pretty much going to be excreted out of your system. And so barium sulfate is a good imaging agent because barium really absorbs the x-rays. And so it provide really good contrast between the things that absorb the x-rays versus the things that don't absorb the x-rays. What did I say about beryllium? Does anybody remember about beryllium? Hmm? Beryllium makes excellent... Maybe I didn't say this. Beryllium is an excellent x-ray window. A window lets x-rays pass through. Whereas lead is a good x-ray absorber. What's the difference between beryllium and lead? The, the number of electrons. So beryllium has barely any electrons. And so it doesn't absorb much in the way of x-rays. And so uh, it's, it's also a solid, so they can make windows, and structurally it's strong. But beryllium is incredibly toxic. You know, I had a friend at JPL he, uh, who asked me if he, I could use, if he could use some of my garage space to store stuff uh, that he bought surplus. And I was asking, what is it? And he said, just high vacuum equipment. And I asked him, What's, what, what type of equipment? And then he, he told me, uh, some of the stuff has beryllium windows. Do you want beryllium in your garage? I mean, maybe I'm being paranoid, but I don't want any beryllium anywhere because uh, reading the studies about beryllium, I think it is like something like microgram quantities means, you know, death by cancer you know, 30 years later. So it's not that I'm going to live another 30 years, but I you know, don't want to increase any risks. Well, anyway, that, that's the story about that. Um, and so, it, I, you know, those types of things, sometimes you can make a connection, you know, lead versus beryllium, and then think, you know, what, what's the reasoning? Lead is an absorber, beryllium's a, a window. Anyway, um, so that's that. The Nobel Prize in Physics, and this is a lot of chemistry here because a lot of chemists were working on this as well. And uh, this, this project, you know, there's a big race for LEDs because um, the red LED's been around for a long time, the green LED's been around for a long time, but nobody had a blue LED. Because if you have red, green, and blue, do you know what you can make? You can make the whole color spectrum. In other words, you can make white light, but if you only have red and blue, you can't make all the colors from red and blue. And so people wanted the blue LED, and lots of people were working on this. You know, physicists, chemists, material scientists. And you had a two-pronged approach. You had the theoreticians, you know, trying to calculate what the best composition would be to give you that blue LED. And then you had the experimental chemist just mixing up different semiconductors to see, you know, if you dope it this much, what changes in the optical properties, dope it that much, you know, base, base semiconductors, um, you know, silicon, uh, silicon nitride, etc. And so uh, they were working on, um, um, oops, not these guys here, this commercial. <laughs> but uh, this team was uh, working on uh, finding it. And, you know, actually, the experimental, I shouldn't say this, because the experimental, the, the people who do these, did I talk about these little micro reactors that allow like 1,000 different compositions at once? You know, yeah, you have the that you have the the brute force approach. Just mix up a whole bunch of different compositions and then measure their optical properties and see. You know, so it's an experimental approach based on observation and uh, synthesis. And so, you know, a lot of it, a lot of people who do that have some kind of target. You know, they have a target that's based on theory, or they have a target that's based on you know, how they see the properties change with composition. And so they aren't just um, going blind into making these different formulations. But it turned out that this guy is largely experimental. This guy's not a theor theoretical guy. This guy didn't calculate, you know, what the best. This guy was in there mixing 
different compositions and sing. And then he hit it, the blue LED. I mean, this was, did I talk about this before? No, this was like the, um, <laughs> this was like the, the saw, long sought after, you know, nobody knew, you know, if they're going to get it or not in this, in this lifetime, but they got it, you know, and that, that was, this was a, a major triumph. In, uh, and then, you know, now it's being widely used. Uh, I didn't, you know, I, I know this because he moved, this guy moved to Santa Barbara. And so he's at UCSB now. And um, the story went around that he was working for a private company. And the private company, I thought it was awarded him like a $5,000 bonus for this. And the company went on to make billions of dollars from the royalties of this. And so, um, but it turned out it wasn't even five thousand dollars. I just read the article again. He only got two hundred dollar bonus for developing the blue LED, <laughs> and the company itself went on to make billions of dollars. And then, and then this company sues him for for moving to UCSB and then disclosing, you know, uh, private. I mean, um, whatever they call it. And then, then he countersues and he wins big, actually. And so, well, big, I, I don't know if it's big, $8.1 million, but something that the company got, you know, billions for. But anyway, uh, that's the story of the blue LED. So, you know, there's still a lot. If, if the theory was there and they could easily predict it, then, you know, it would be so easy because, oh, you just cal do some calculations, you figure out what's going to give you the blue LED, and you're done. And then have somebody make it. You know, a lot of theoreticians don't know how to make stuff, so... No. That's, uh, well, anyway, this is the uh, Nobel Prizes what yesterday. Okay. What's that? Uh, what's so difficult? Uh, what's so difficult is nobody knew exact, the exact composition of the semiconductor, you know, and how much to dope, how much to do this that would give you the blue LED. The theoreticians have been trying to figure this out, but the theoreticians come up with a formulation, this should be close. Somebody goes out and makes it, the synthetic people, and it doesn't, it doesn't emit blue. And so the theory's off a little bit. The theory's off a little bit because the theory is so complicated and the calculations are so difficult. You know, these, these calculations cannot be solved exactly. Normally when you're given a math problem, you'd like to solve it to the final answer and get the exact answer that it's supposed to be. But in life, you know, you can't model it by a simple mathematical equation. It's much more complicated and therefore you have to introduce approximations. Otherwise, there were, uh, actually, to give you an example of this, when I was um, doing some theoretical calculations for, um, for simple things like what's the best structural geometry for ethanol, you know, something like that. These are theoretical calculations that have been done, but this was just a student thing. I would, um, I would submit the calculations on one day and then come back the next day and hope they compile to an answer just for ethanol. You know, what, what the best structure for ethanol, the bond angles and everything else, the bond lengths. And so that was over a 24-hour calculation. You know? um, that was just using a PC uh, with a 386 processor, which was very was really slow. Now, that same calculation is done in um, 30 seconds, you know, or less, probably less than 30 seconds, you know? just on a... On a, on a um, like a duo processor, you know, it would be done. And so uh, the the theoretical chemistry has come a long way. You know, people have been searching for blue LED for years, decades, actually, and not hit it. And then um, and they hit it. Now we take it for granted, you know, the blue LED. But without the blue LED, we wouldn't have, um, like, LED TVs and that kind of stuff. Uh, anyway, or even LED you know, lights, you know, the LED lights that emit white light. You know, you could have an LED that emitted red. You can have an LED that emitted green or combinations of those two. Those were around, but not an LED that emits white. And so those, all the white light bulbs, this is why they are saying they awarded. This is unusual because, you know, he's a synthetic type person. Mix it and see what happens, you know.
kind of thing. This is like skeleton redox. With skeleton redox, you mix and see what happens. Because tell me, you know, tell me, like when I spray ammonia into methane flame, am I going to form hydrogen cyanide or am I going to form NOx? Well, it depends on the conditions, the temperature, everything else, pressure. All these factors come into play in determining what your products are going to be. So if you could just simply whip out a calculation and do it, then that would be great. But when you do these calculations, they're highly complex. And um, the answers, you know, in other words, uncertainty, your confidence in the answer isn't so great because there's a lot of uncertainty in the calculation and the error bars are huge meaning that you know you wouldn't bet your life on it would you on a lot of these whereas this 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 is because you know people bet their life on on these theoretical calculations to get to the moon right but for this we're going to be talking about this but the, for classical physics you know there's a lot less uncertainty the amount of uncertainty is is very very small compared to you know uh, what you're trying to do hit the moon which isn't which is easy but when we're dealing with single molecules this type of stuff and seeing how single molecules react then the degree of uncertainty is huge you know and therefore it's not such an easy thing to do when you're looking at the energies I mean it's still small relative to the macroscopic world but it's huge compared to the single molecule world, you know well, anyway, uh, we're going to finish up chapter six today and then uh, continue with chapter seven. So let's talk about the remaining aspects of chapter six. Uh, so we got the kinetic, we did the kinetic energy calculations, right? All right. Um, there are other other things that are important. There's things like the mean free path. Actually, maybe I'll turn this on. You know what the mean free path is? So what is other? Uh, other other important concepts in kinetic molecular theory. Here we can see um, the mean free path, some uh, calculated values just off Wikipedia. So ambient pressure, this is a millibar, 1,013 millibar, which is about how many atmospheres? One. One atmosphere. Uh, we, we have some kind of density here. How many molecules per cubic centimeter? Molecules per cubic meter. And then the mean free path. You can see it's mostly empty space, 10 and 19 molecules per cubic centimeter. That huge. Well, the mean free path, 68 nanometers. This is the distance, the average distance a molecule travel, travels before collides. So it's like ambient pressure. If we go to something like ultra high vacuum, ultra high vacuum is 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 12 millibar. Millibar is like a, a tor or millimeter of mercury. You know, it's close to millimeter of mercury. So, like 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 12 millimeters of mercury. The molecule travels one kilometer to 10 to the fifth kilometers before collision. It's huge distance. There's very few molecules. If you look in a cubic centimeter, there's only 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 4th molecules per cubic centimeter. That's a long distance to travel before colliding. Isn't uh, extremely high vacuum. So typically, we uh, I was doing vacuums of uh, around this range, high vacuum to ultra high vacuum range when I was working with vacuums. So I was looking at centimeters for mean theory path. But getting high vacuum is not that difficult. Ultra high vacuum, you need that specialized equipment. It looks like submarines, you know, very thick stainless steel tubes and that kind of stuff. And it's very Vacuum work is very difficult because tiny leaks means you don't get a decent vacuum. And it's so difficult getting rid of those leaks sometimes. Well, mean free path, we aren't going to calculate it. Um, just 
my hair. And then there's something called the collision frequency. This, this gives you an idea of how, um, how to visualize the, the gases. Collision frequency, uh, what do you think that is? How many times? How many times it collides? Oh, yeah, per, per second. In one second. How many times it collides in one second? Collision frequencies are actually quite large uh, for gases. And so let me give you some numbers. Here. <laughs> Uh, so here's some collision frequencies. We're looking at big numbers, 10 to the 10, 10 to 11 collisions per second. There's a lot of collisions. But it turns out that not all those collisions result in a reaction. You know, some of the collisions are with the wall, some of the collisions are with the other molecules, but not enough energy in that collision to break bonds to get it to react. And so only a tiny fraction of these collisions um, result in a reaction here. But we can see these are collisions for reactions. So this is just other, other words you should be familiar with for this. Now, the, one of the applications we're going to do for this uh, is something diffusion and diffusion. You know what diffusion is? Diffusion is how long it takes to go from point A to point B. How long? So how fast is the molecule moving? Fast, over a thousand miles an hour. If it's moving that fast, then it doesn't take long to get from point A to point B, except for the fact that at ambient, at ambient pressure, what is the mean free path, roughly? It would be a pressure, the mean free path is roughly 68 nanometers. Is that, 68 nanometers isn't very long, is that? No. And so what that means is it doesn't get very far until it collides. And what is the collision frequency? Very high. And so you know what? In getting from point A to point B, it's not so easy. In getting from point A to point B, it's not like it's traveling in an empty room. This would be like, look, imagine you're at a, a jam-packed event and uh, you have to get from one point to the other point going through a, a packed crowd and they're packed in like sardines, let's say. Just, you're going to have so many collisions and then eventually you might end up going the wrong way. And so by the time it gets to point B, what has happened? You know, by the time it gets to point B, it's probably traveled a long time. And so, if it's going at a thousand miles an hour, um, then you know, within a half an hour, it should be how far is San Francisco? Five hundred miles? I think five, or maybe more than five hundred. Not seven hundred miles. But San Diego is how far? Two hundred miles. So let's say it should get to. If it's traveling a thousand miles an hour, it should get to San Francisco in a half an hour or so, an hour, less than an hour, right? Is that true? No, not even close. For example, uh, like let's say you're brewing some spearmint tea. If you're brewing some spearmint tea, uh, then carbon is a, a flavor molecule for that. Carbon travels about 500 miles an hour. And so if you're brewing spearmint tea in the, in the kitchen, would you smell it, let's say, in the living room in an instant, or does it take some time to travel? It takes time to travel, even though it's moving at 500 miles an hour. And so this is the diffusion. Um, what we're going to do with diffusion is we're just going to compare rates. That is, we're going to compare the rate of diffusion of molecule A compared to the rate of diffusion of molecule B. And so we're just going to see you know, how much how much faster or how much slower the rate of diffusion is for these. The rate of diffusion is directly uh, proportional to the speed. The speed of molecule A is 3RT over the molar mass of A. 
And the speed of B is 3RT over the molar mass of B. And so when we look at this, uh, and 3RTs cancel, we get that the rate of A is inversely proportional to the molar mass of A, and the rate of B is inversely proportional to the molar mass of B. So we end up with something like this. And so let's say um, that A, well, let's say B, we'll go with B. Let's say B is two times heavier. If B is two times heavier, is it moving two times slower? No. Um, if it's two times heavier, this would be square root of two. It would be the square root of two times slower, or A would be square root of two times faster. And so the rate and, and time are inversely proportional. And so the rate of B is inversely proportional to the time it takes for B, and the rate of A is inversely proportional to the time it takes for A. Okay, so diffusion is that. Um, diffusion is like this. Diffusion is if you have a box or a balloon or some kind of container um, that contains gas particles in here. Diffusion is how fast it would take for the gas particles to leak out of a pinhole. And so the rate of effusion, we can compare, you know, how fast gases will leak out of a pinhole. Um, and it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be the root of the uh, differences in masses, there, or the ratio of the masses. And so diffusion and effusion, we just do a comparison. How many times slower or how many times faster will A diffuse or effuse? Yeah. And that's it. So those calculations aren't so difficult um, to do. All right, that's um, chapter six. In an effort to save some time, you know, I'll answer questions about the stoichiometry or problems in Chapter 6 as they come up when you're doing the homework. So we'll, we'll revisit this as the questions come up. But uh, I want to move on to Chapter 7 next. Chapter 7 deals with thermal chems. This is thermodynamics, part 1. So we're going to look at um, energy, you know, and heat, temperature, those concepts. Um, so uh, the first thing is, uh, let's talk about heat and temperature. Is heat and temperature the same thing? No. no. Heat, um, we give the symbol Q. <clears throat> temperature, it's just T. Right? And so, how are heat and temperature related? Yeah, the more heat, the hotter you would expect things to become. Right? The, the strange thing is, uh, if you heat, let's say, a gallon of water versus heating an iron pot. You know, heating the iron pot is going to heat up much more rapidly than a gallon of water. Yesterday, somebody left their beaker um, on the hot plate, and eventually all the water evaporated. And once all the wa water evaporated, you know what happens to the temperature? Skyrockets. You know, having all that water in there kept the temperature down. And so when I removed it, you know, there was a little bit of water around, and it was... Uh, sizzled quite quite a lot because it was so hot. But anyway, heat and temperature are related by something called the heat capacity. It depends on the type of matter we're dealing with. 
you know, different uh, pieces of matter, for example, iron versus water, will have different heat capacities. Water is said to have a high heat capacity. High heat capacity. Sometimes water is called a heat sink because it has such high heat capacity, it just <clears throat> absorbs and absorbs heat. Whereas iron or copper or a lot of metals have low heat capacity. That is, it doesn't have much heat capacity ability to absorb heat without increasing the temperature significantly. And so um, what do these mean? Uh, this means um, high heat capacity means lots of heat you know, for little temperature change, delta T. Low heat capacity means if we give it lots of Q, we have yeah a large delta T, a large temperature, and so it doesn't have much ability to absorb. Now, um, there are different units. The units of heat capacity the units of heat capacity is, is like this. Typically, when we measure this, it's going to be in um, joules or calories, so label CAL. Joules or calories. You guys are familiar with joules and calories, right? Yeah. Per, okay, amount, and then there's going to be some kind of temperature change, you know, delta T. I'll just call it delta T. And so the, one of the most common units it would be joules per gram degree C. Okay, so when we think about H2O liquid, H2O liquid, a lot of people have this one memorized. It's 4.18 joules per gram degree C which means that it requires 4.18 joules to warm up one gram of water by one degree C. This is also equivalent to 1.00 calories per gram degree C. And so what this means is that this is a, uh, call this a specific heat. Specific heats have the amount in mass, amount in grams. We can have the amount in moles too, that's often convenient as well. And so we could have joules or calories per mole degree C. This one's called the molar heat capacity. So for example, water would have a molar heat capacity of this. It would be 18.02 calories per mole degree C. So a mole of water is 18.02 grams. It would be 18.02 times the specific heat. So we get this, the molar heat capacity. The third unit that we have is called the um, heat capacity of an object. And so joules or calories per object per de delta T, degree C. And so let's say you have a brick. You, know, um, you don't want to weigh the brick, right? And you don't want to figure out how many moles of whatever is in there. And so the easiest is just to do a brick. And so let's say, uh, as an example, maybe it's, um, I'm just guessing, 3,000 joules per brick per degree C. Let's say it's a pretty big brick. It takes a lot of heat to warm it up by degree C. 
Sometimes people get rid of the brick. If, there's, if you know you're talking about bricks and only bricks, sometimes people will say this, 3,000 joules per degree C, you know, where it's known that we're talking about a single brick. If you have two bricks, then you have to double it. But sometimes you don't have two bricks. Sometimes you always have a single object. And that single object would be uh, like a calorimeter. Let's do another example here. Let's say 11 joules per calorimeter. A calor do you know what a calorimeter is? A calorimeter is an object that we use to measure heat capacity and other things as well. But um, it's, a, it's an object where you introduce a Q and then see what the temperature change is. That's an instrument that does that. Per degree C. Since we only work with one calorimeter always, then heat capacities of calorimeters are always given like this, 11 joules per degree C. This would be for calorimeter. Calorimeter heat capacity. Because we'd never have two calorimeters. We'd only have one calorimeter. And so there's no reason to put how many calorimeters we have. So that's heat capacity. All right, so let's use some of this uh, to do some calculations. Since you're probably not, have, have you done calorimetry calculations in Chem 4? No. So you've done a lot of gas calculations, so that's why I'm skipping the gas and going to this. Let's go to. Um, Take a look at some sample calculations from chapter seven. I'll show you what a calorimeter looks like. You guys know this, right? One calories, 4.184 joules. Piece of reaction. The reason why I only cite this to, actually I erased it. The reason I do water to 4.18 is because the water's specific heat changes slightly depending on the temperature you're at. And so it's only good to three sig figs over the, over the temperature range, the full temperature range of water. Heat here at 7.2. So uh, let's take a look at some of these uh, calculations here. Let's see if I can show you a calorimeter. I'll show you a calorimeter first before I go. Cal this would be a calorimeter, for example. Do you want to weigh the calorimeter? No. Nah. Do you want to figure out how many moles of stuff is in the calorimeter? No, you just want to treat the whole thing as an object, right? And so how do you figure out the, the heat capacity of the calorimeter? The heat about you introduce a certain amount of heat in here and you see how much does the calorimeter warm up, this whole big object right? that's completely sealed. And then we figure it out. Well, how much heat, we have to use something that we know gives off a certain amount of heat, you know, a standard, right? It, that we use. And there are lots of standards that people use for calorimetry. They put the standard in there, ignite it, it releases a fixed amount of heat, measure the temperature change. Now we know how many degrees C it went up for how much Q we got from burning that. All right, so uh, we'll look at some problems here. Let's do, let's do number four. Mm 
Actually, maybe we should take a look at these since this is new stuff. So let's look at number one. Uh, calculate the quantity of heat in kilojoules required to raise a temperature of 90.25 liters of water from 22 to 29.4 degrees C. Maybe we'll start off easy since. Um, so uh, we'll do 1 8 to start off with that rather than jump into something a little more complicated. So we got 9.25 liters of water. So we have 9.25 liters of water. This is H2O liquid. And we're at a temperature of um, 22.0 degrees C. And then we want to go to uh, H2O liquid at 29.4 degrees C. 9.25 liters, so the amount of water can change. So we're just going to raise the temperature here. Now the way we, we solve this is well, we just use dimensional analysis. We have a conversion factor. What do you know about water? What I know about water is it's 4.18 joules per gram degree C. And so I, I want to know how much heat and so if I have this, what do I need? I need to know how many grams, and I need to know how many degrees C was my temperature change in order to get how many joules. And so it's simple. We just got to get rid of the grams. How do we cancel out the grams? Well, I have 9.25 liters of water, H2O liquid, and then convert that to what? Yeah, so I'm going to go to milliliters, a thousand milliliters per liter, and then we know the density of water. There's 1.00 grams of H2O liquid per milliliter. Now, does the density of water change with temperature? It does. It's only good to three sig figs over a wide temperature range, but if you need a more accurate value, you look it up in a table. And you can get it from there. And so now we have grams of water. So the units, liters cancel liters, milliliters cancel milliliters, grams cancels grams. Now what else do we have to cancel? The temperature change. And so we need a delta T. This is our delta T. What is our temperature change? Because this degree C is a delta T. It's a temperature change, right? And so delta T is T final minus T initial. So T final is 29.4 minus 22.0, and the units would be degrees C. The degrees C cancels, and that leaves us with joules. And so we just use dimensional analysis for this. And we get how many joules? 286. 131. 121. 286,121 joules. How many sig figs are we allowed? Three. And it, it's easiest just to go to kilojoules. So let's go 286 points of one kilojoules. You know, rather than having hundreds of thousands of joules, we'll just have hundreds of kilojoules. 286.1 kilojoules is the key required to raise the temperature. How many calories would this be? So to figure out how many calories, um, we know that in um, there's going to be one kilocalorie for every 4.18 kilojoules. Right? And so we would just divide it by 4.18, and that would give us how many kilocalories? 68. 68.5. 68.5? Right. 68.5. K cows. And so kilojoules uh, or K cows are very common. Joules, calories, very common. This dimensional analysis, do you see the dimensional analysis? This dimensional analysis is given as this equation. Q is equal to the amount times C times delta T. This just comes from units. The amount depends on C. C is the heat capacity, and we have three units of heat capacity, right? 
And so the amount will be either grams, moles, or objects, number of objects. In Chem 4, you, you memorize Q is equal to MC delta T, right? Do you, do you guys remember MC delta T? But in Chem 1A, we don't call it M because we don't always work with grams. We work with moles or objects sometimes. So that's why I'm not calling MC delta T. The others are very similar. Um, well, here's a decrease in temperature. Uh, let's go ahead and do B as well, because um, we'll talk about the sign convention. Next. And so if we do 1B, uh, let's calculate quantity heat in kilojoules associated with a 33.5 degrees C decrease in temperature of 5.85 kilogram aluminum bar. Okay, so we have some aluminum. Now I'm going to do this. If something's at a higher temperature, is that a higher energy? Hotter temperature, higher energy. Yes. Yes, because temperature is directly proportional to what? Temperature is directly proportional to what? Not, don't call it heat. Temperature is direct. It is, it is, but from last chapter, chapter six. Hmm? Kinetic energy. You know what heat is? Heat is the transfer of kinetic energy from a hot object to a cold object. So if you touch a hot piece of metal, the atoms in the metal are vibrating rapidly, and the atoms in your skin aren't. And then when you touch this, then that Kinetic energy is transferred to your skin, so pretty soon your skin is vibrating at a high kinetic energy, which causes burns, right? And so what I'm going to start to do is I'm going to, let's look at it this way. We have a, a aluminum solid, and it's hot. And so this is T hot. And then we go to T cold. I don't know what T cold or T hot is. And we got the aluminum solid here. And so there's going to be a drop in temperature. This is our delta T, right? Energy increase is going up. Our delta T is going to be 30, 33.5 degrees C decrease. If it's a decrease, we call it negative because 33.5 degrees C decrease in, in temperature, a drop in temperature. So now, rather than doing this using conventional analysis, I'm just using, using our equation. Our equation is Q is equal to the amount times C times delta T. And so the amount of aluminum solid is given 5.85 kilograms. C is given 0.903 joules. 0.903 joules is low heat capacity or high heat capacity? Low. You know, that's a lot less than, about four times less than water. So aluminum has a low heat capacity. Times delta T. Our delta T is negative 33.5 degrees C. We have a temperature drop. Kilograms and grams don't cancel, so I need to get rid of the kilograms. So one kilogram is equal to 1,000 grams. But then, you know, I'll probably want to go to kilojoules anyway, but let's see. Can somebody calculate this? Tell me how many joules we have. Negative 176,000. Negative 176,000. 965. 965 joules. Again, joules is inconvenient, so we're going to go to kilojoules. Negative 176.9 kilojoules is what we have here. All right. Now uh, I'm going to talk about the sign convention. What does the negative sign mean? 
Okay, is there such thing as negative 176 kilojoules or 177 kilojoules? There's no such thing. Just like, is there such thing as a negative $177? Is there a negative $177 or negative $10 bill? There's no such thing. Energy is the same thing. Energy is always positive. The negative just tells us the direction of exchange. And so there's no such thing as negative energy. Uh, well, I shouldn't say, what should I say? No such thing as negative 177 kilojoules of energy. Well, negative means it's exothermic. No such thing as negative 176 kilojoules of energy. The negative sign tells us the direction of exchange. Um, it tells us the direction of exchange then we have to define something. We know negative means exothermic, right? This is exothermic. Exothermic means energy lost. Now, that's probably as far as you got in Chem 4, exothermic versus endothermic, right? Well, we're going to get a little bit more specific because we're going to have to define well, what actually lost the energy. And so we need to talk about the system and surroundings. So if we're doing a calculation for the system, then negative 177 kilojoules means the system lost 177 kilojoules. In other words, 177 kilojoules was transferred from the system to the surroundings. Sometimes we do calculations for the surroundings. If we do the calculation for the surroundings, then the surroundings lost it to the, the system. And so it depends on what the Q is. Is it the Q for the system or is it the Q for the surroundings? And so if I say this, well, this is going to be the Q of the system. The system is going to be aluminum block, right? That's our system. What is our surroundings? Where did that energy go? Uh, didn't, does it say water? No, that was A. Yeah, it, it is. What we call the surroundings is called the rest of the universe. And so basically, 177 kilojoules of energy was transferred from our aluminum to the rest of the universe, whatever the rest of the universe is. That would be it. OK, so what we say is this. We say aluminum lost minus 177 kilojoules, or aluminum lost 177 kilojoules. Which one is true? The second one? The second one is true. This one is false. We'd never say this. What is true is you could say Q of the system, which is equal to Q of the aluminum, is equal to minus 177 kilojoules. Is this true? Yes, this would be true. This is true. This is our sign convention. Here, we see the system lost energy here. If we write this in here, then this is wrong. This loss actually means the negative sign here. It's our sign convention. We have um, different types of systems. 
that we deal with. The types of systems that we're looking at would be one. We have uh, something called a isolated system. I'll talk about that in a second. I'll leave some space. We have a closed system. And we have a open system. So let's take a look at these uh, systems. Probably I'll just use the book's illustrations for these. An isolated system is completely isolated from the rest of the universe. And in other words, there's a barrier that sounds or surrounds it so that nothing can be exchanged with the rest of the universe. So that barrier would have to be totally thermally insulated so no heat can escape out of there. And the barrier would have to provide an airtight, gas-tight, liquid-tight seal so no, no matter can escape out of there. And so this would be an isolated system, which is just um, a room, and, and, and uh, it's completely uh, detached, or it's a little bubble in the universe. So an isolated system, this isn't exactly right, but this is a, a, an approximation of an isolated system here. No heat can escape. No matter can escape, no heat can go in, no matter can go in. It's kind of isolated. Right. At the other extreme is an open system. In an open system, anything can be exchanged. This is totally open. So if we call the, the system this beaker with this liquid in here and the gas, you can see that some of the gas can escape out of here. This looks like bromine. No, no it's not bromine because the vapor would be brown. It's something else. But anyway, the gas can escape, gas can come in. Gas can be absorbed here, heat can escape, heat can come in. And so this would be an open system. We don't work with open systems and we don't work with isolated. Sometimes we work with isolated systems, you know. Um, isolated systems, sometimes we don't want any heat to, to escape. You know? We call those adiabatic. I don't know if you've heard that. But uh, we'll talk about it later. This is called a closed system. In a closed system, matter cannot go in and out, but heat or energy can come in and come out. And so what we deal with is a, is a closed system. So this block of aluminum, what type of system is that? The block of aluminum is closed because aluminum is not going to break off and vaporize into, into the air. The aluminum is stuck there, and that's our system. But heat can easily go in and out of the block of aluminum, and therefore it's a closed system. We're going to be working with closed systems mainly, and once in a while we'll, we'll look at an isolated system. And we aren't going to deal with that. Like okay, so if energy escapes, we call it minus Q. If energy goes in, we call it plus Q. Energy in the form of kinetic energy exchange, heat. But in a closed system, this isn't the perfect closed system. Because the closed system that we work with is not going to be a rigid fixed volume like this. Actually, we have two closed systems. Let's, see. let's, let's concentrate on this closed system here. So when we look at the closed system, we have two types of closed system. We have one, the uh, constant volume closed system. If you look at this, you know, can the volume of the system change? No, it's rigid, it's fixed. But that means if any gas builds up in here, that stopper better be on there tight, otherwise it's gonna pop off and become an open system, right? And so the stopper's on there tight. 
That means, you know, this has to withstand some pressure, pressure fluctuations. You know, maybe if some gas is consumed in here, the pressure is going to drop, so it's going to be like vacuum equipment. Vacuum, vacuum equipment, you know, you worry about implosions. High pressure equipment, you worry about explosions. But both are dangerous. And so this is a fixed volume close system, or what we just call a constant volume. The second type of closed system is called a constant pressure. So how would I redesign that to make it a constant pressure system? Well, a constant pressure system, what I would have here is I'd put my stuff in here, right? And then I'd have a lid like this. Mm -hmm. And so um, here I have the pressure of the rest of the universe. What did I call the rest of the universe? Surrounding. So here I have the pressure of the surroundings, you know, just in the lab, which is accumulated of the whole atmosphere, 200,000 feet of atmosphere, or whatever it is. Well, I got the pressure of the rest of the universe or the surroundings. And inside here, I have the pressure of the system. And these are, these are equalized. That is, in other words, the pressure never changes. That, that means if I generate gas, the lid rises. If I consume gas, the lid contracts. So the lid can move up and down to maintain constant pressure. So I just say movable lid. And so the volume of the system can expand and contract to maintain constant pressure. And so volume of system increases or decreases to maintain constant pressure. Whereas up here, the pressure increases or decreases to maintain constant, constant volume. What do you think we do mostly? Do we do stuff at constant pressure or constant volume? Constant volume? Do, when you do a, re a chemical reaction, do you seal it up tight, make that lid on there, hope the test tube can withstand the pressure that builds up and doesn't explode in your hand or implode? No, most of the reactions you do are under conditions of constant pressure. And so most chemistry occurs here. When most chemistry occurs under constant pressure conditions, is Dalton's law of partial pressures valid? No. Dalton's law of partial pressures is only valid under constant volume conditions. And so this is why, you know, I don't really emphasize Dalton's law of partial pressures because it's only valid under constant volume conditions. We don't do that many things under constant volume conditions, so we don't use it all that often. We use more, more often we use, instead of Dalton's law of partial pressures, we use Avogadro's law of partial volumes. And so when we're mixing things up, we you yeah, had X milliliters of O2 and X milliliters of Y2, uh, H2, and mix it up, or whatever you do. Okay. It's not to say we don't. Let's take a look at a system, and you tell me, is it constant pressure or constant volume?
Okay, this is our, our, our system. Um, our system is inside this container here. Constant pressure or constant volume? Our system, our system is going to, we're going to put something in here, an object in here, and that's going to be our system. We have a reaction in here. That's going to be our system. Is our system constant volume or constant pressure? Constant volume. It's constant volume, so that means it has to, this thing has to withstand pressure increases and pressure decreases. In other words, it structurally has to be strong. And they call it the steel, this, this thing is called the steel bomb. You know why it's called a bomb? Because if you don't build it strong enough, it's going to explode like a bomb, right? And so this is called a bomb calorimeter, and it's a constant volume calorimeter to maintain constant volume. So, um, the next type of cal um, uh, this. <laughs> This is a, the low budget calorimeter. This is a coffee cup. You put your system inside the styrofoam cups here. We call this our system inside the cup. Is this um, completely sealed off so that, no. And unfortunately, it doesn't have a movable lid, but nothing's really going to escape if you just do aqueous reactions in here. So you do aqueous reactions, you don't expect uh, gases unless. Mm, Sometimes you'll expect gases, but even if the gases are formed, you want them to escape to maintain constant, what? Constant pressure. This is a constant pressure. Gases can leak in, gases can leak out. It, although it's technically not closed, because to be closed, it would have to be sealed so that it's a movable lid. But this is good enough. It's close enough to being called a closed system, right? Close enough. Not perfect. Okay, uh, we're okay with systems, I think. And so let's talk about <clears throat> there are two types of closed systems. What are they? Constant volume and constant pressure. Now, there are two types of systems in general. It doesn't matter what, what we're doing. What can I put inside here? I could put objects. I could put a hot object in here and see what happens with the temperature, right? For example, that would be perfect over here. I put a hot object in here. The hot object releases heat to the surroundings, whole thing, and Surrounding warm up, bomb warms up. So uh, that would be a system as an object. So uh, let's say I, I put a hot piece of metal, iron at 250 degrees C, and then let it cool down. To iron at 150 degrees C. So my hot object cooled down, right? So objects either warm up or cool down with heat. And we can model that using Q. Q is equal to the amount times C times delta T. So lost energy. Opposite, we could warm it up. The other type of system that we're going to be dealing with is a reaction or process. When I say process, typically I'm talking about phase changes. You know what a phase change is? 
Yeah, change the state. And so let's see this. H2O solid at zero degrees C. It's a block of ice, right? What happens if I add heat to this block of ice? Is the object going to warm up? Yeah, no. No, the object doesn't warm up. You know what happens? As I add energy to this, as I add heat to this, here, this Q would be less than zero or greater than zero? Less than zero because we've got to lose heat, right? Over here, this Q is going to be greater than zero. We've got to gain heat. And then what we're going to get here is we're going to get H2O liquid, but the temperature did not increase. The temperature is going to stay zero degrees C until we melt all of it. Once all of it's been melted, then the temperature will increase. And so here, does Q equal the amount times C times delta T? No, this is wrong. This is the equation for objects, physical objects. We have a different equation for reactions and processes. For reactions and processes, Q is equal to the amount times something called delta H. Or delta U. Delta H is for you know the difference? You probably don't know the difference. I've never heard it before. But let me tell you, because I'm jumping ahead here. Delta H is for constant pressure. So if we do this under constant pressure conditions, this is the amount. Delta U is what we use under constant volume. So we got to see, is our system constant pressure or constant volume? For some things, it doesn't matter, because constant pressure and constant volume are the same thing. The only time that constant pressure and constant volume are different is when gases are formed or gases are consumed. That's when they're different. But otherwise, they're the same. And so we, we keep track of this, um, all these things, because these things will have an impact on how much energy is being produced or consumed in uh, these processes. And so it's a lot of stuff to... Uh, to worry about, um, but uh, let's do some calculations. Some of the calculations aren't that hard. It's just this stuff, you know, <clears throat> since there are a lot of new words here, maybe uh, it takes time to just get the definitions down and then start applying them. All right, so we're going to look at objects and processes uh, and then try to figure out some stuff based on that. So what was I looking at? Number four? Okay, let's do number four. Um, not only would these, these types of thermal count problems, it helps to draw it out some time. And so we have a 75 gram piece of silver metal and it's heated. And so one thing I might do is do something like this. I'll put my silver solid here, and then I'm going to heat it. So the temperature is going to be 80 degrees C, and it's 75.0 grams. And it doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the temperature. So I'll have my block of silver here, and it's going to be, ooh, it's heated to 80 degrees C and drop into 50 grams of water. Ah. So maybe instead of doing this, we'll do this, we'll drop it into 50 grams of water. H2O liquid at 23.2 degrees C. Okay, so what's going to happen is the silver is going to cool down, the water is going to heat up. So what do you want to call our system here? No, 
open. Well, the, yeah, technically it would be an open, but um, we're going to simplify this. Sometimes we do this. You're right, it's going to be an open because what's going to happen is more water is going to vaporize off the surface. The water is going to skate out of there, right? But we are going to ignore that completely. We're going to say that there's going to be no vaporization or anything. We're going to make this very simple. And so what we're going to call our system is this. This is our system. And that means the rest of the universe is the surroundings. But, you know, we don't want to deal with the rest of the universe because that's too much headache. And so do you know what we're going to call our surroundings? Just this. We aren't even going to consider the beaker because what do you think is going to happen to the beaker? The beaker is going to warm up too, but, you know, we're going to ignore the beaker. We're going to say maybe it's styrofoam. And the styrofoam is not going to absorb much. You know? And so uh, ignore container. We ignore the container. What do you think is going to happen to the air above this? It's going to warm up. We're going to ignore the air. We're going to ignore any kind of water vapor that forms up here. We're going to ignore all that. And in fact, we're going to ignore the rest of the universe. We're just going to call this our surroundings. So this is a very simplified surroundings. Otherwise, it becomes a headache. Right? And so let's just keep the surroundings sim simple. And so what's going to happen is the silver is going to cool down. That is, it's going to lose energy, and the water is going to warm up. And so the silver loses energy, the water gains energy. Keep it, keep it like that. Uh, now we're going to talk about the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics most people uh, memorized in Chem 4, and that is energy is neither created nor destroyed. In other words, delta E of the universe is equal to zero. The amount of energy in the universe is fixed, is constant. The amount of energy in the universe is constant. There's no new energy being made or energy being lost. It's just being exchanged. And so here we're exchanging energy from the system to surroundings, but you know. And so another way of stating the first law of thermodynamics is that delta E for the system is equal to minus delta E of the surroundings, where minus is just to change signs. In other words, opposite sign. It doesn't mean that the surroundings is exothermic. It just means if it's exothermic, we make it endothermic to make it the system. So opposite sign. That's all. And so another way of stating this is that Q of the system is equal to minus Q of the surroundings. Because the only energy being exchanged here is heat or kinetic, kinetic energy from a hot silver object to cold water. And so we could figure this out um, here. Let me redraw this. All right. So um, we have silver, chunk of silver, solid, in our system. This is be our system here, going from 80.0 degrees C, dropping down to 27.6 degrees C. That's 75.0 
grams. And so Q, the amount of heat, is equal to the amount of silver times C times delta T. All right, what are they asking for here? They're asking for what is the uh, specific heat of silver. They don't tell us the specific heat of silver. And so we have two unknowns here. One unknown is Q. We don't know how much heat. And C, we don't know what the specific heat is. And so if we have multiple unknowns, and we need another equation to, to solve this. What's the other equation? Yeah, for water. Um, so for water, we have this. The amount of heat absorbed has got to be equal and opposite. And so the heat increase in water, this will be our system. This will be our surroundings. And so the water, well, what is the amount of water? 50 grams of water. So the H2O liquid, 50.0 grams. And the initial temperature was 23.2 degrees. And the final temperature is 27.6 degrees C. So uh, interesting, we see that silver must have a low heat capacity because look at silver had a dramatic temperature decrease, whereas water had, you know, well, that amount of silver, 75 grams, it's more, it's more silver than water. So anyway, Q of the surroundings is equal to the amount times C times delta T. The amount is given. We know that. That's 50 grams. C, everybody has to have it memorized. What is C for water? 4.18 units, joules per gram degree C. And delta T, we know, it's T final minus T initial. And so we can get Q of the surroundings. Once we know Q of the surroundings, then we know what Q of the system must be. And so we plug that in here, and then we can solve for C, which is our unknown, our specific heat of water. All right, so I'm going to stop here, and then uh, we'll continue chapter.